So today I want to uh, do two things. I want to finish the discussion of Zookeeper um, and then talk about Crack. Um, the particular things that I'm most interested in talking about about Zookeeper are um, the design of its API that allows Zookeeper to be a general purpose service that really bites off significant um, tasks that distributed systems need. Um, so why is, you know, why is that a good API design? And then the really more specific um, topic of mini transactions. Turns out this is a worthwhile idea to know. So we got um, API and mini Um, just, just to recall, Zookeeper is based on Raft, and so we can think of it as being, and indeed it is, um, fault tolerant and does the right thing with respect to partitions. Um, it has this sort of performance enhancement um, by which reads can be processed at any replica, and therefore the reads can be stale. So we just have to keep this in mind as we're analyzing various uses of the Zookeeper interface. Um, on the other hand, Zookeeper does guarantee that it, Every replica processes the stream of writes in order one at a time with all replicas executing the writes in the same order. So the replicas advance sort of um, and their states evolve in exactly the same way um, and that all of the operation reads and writes produced by a, uh, generated by a single client are processed by the system also in order, both in the order that the client issued them in and um, successive operations from a given client always see the same state or later in the write stream um, as the previous read operation or any operation from that client. Okay, so um, before I dive into what the API looks like and um, why it's useful, it's worth just thinking about what kinds of problems Zookeeper is aiming to solve or could be expected to solve. So um, for me, a totally central example of um, motivation of why you would want to use Zookeeper. This is a, as an implementation of the test and set service that VMware FT required in order to, for either server to take over when the other one failed. Um, so it was a bit of a mystery in the VMware paper, oh, what is this test and set service? How is it made? You know, is it fault tolerant? Does it, it itself tolerate partitions? Um, but Zookeeper actually gives us the tools to write a fault tolerant um, test and set service of exactly the kind that uh, VMware FT needed um, that is fault tolerant and does do the right thing under partitions. That's sort of a central kind of thing that Zookeeper is doing. Um, there's also a bunch of other ways that it turns out people use it. You know, Zookeeper is very successful. People use it for a lot of stuff. Um, one kind of thing people use is just to publish con just configuration information for other servers to use. Like, for example, the IP address of the current master for some set of workers. Um, so this is just config configuration information. Um, another classic use of Zookeeper is to elect a master. You know, if we want to have a, when the old master fails, we need to have everyone agree on who the new master is and only elect one master, even if there's partitions. Um, you can elect a master using Zookeeper primitives. Um, if the master, for small amounts of state at any rate, if whatever master you elect needs to keep some state and needs to keep it up to date, like maybe, you know, information's, such as who the primary is for a given chunk of data like you'd want in GFS. Um, the master can store its state in Zookeeper. It knows Zookeeper's not gonna lose it. If the master crashes and we elect a new master to replace it, that new master can just read the old master state right out of Zookeeper um, and rely on it actually being there. Um, other things you might imagine, maybe in a MapReduce-like system, the workers could register themselves by creating little files in Zookeeper. Um, and um, again, with systems like MapReduce, you can imagine the master telling the workers what to do by writing things in Zookeeper, like writing lists of work in Zookeeper, and then workers sort of take those work items one by one out of Zookeeper and delete them as they complete them. But people use Zookeeper for all these things. Question. Yeah. Yeah. 
Exactly. Uh, yeah, so the question is, oh, yeah, how do people use Zookeeper? And in general, yeah, you, you would, if you're running some big data center and you run all kinds of stuff in your data center, you know, web servers, storage systems, MapReduce, who knows what, you might fire up a Zookeeper, one Zookeeper cluster, because it's general purpose, can be used for lots of things. So, you know, five or seven Zookeeper replicas, and then as you deploy various services, you would design those services to store some of their critical state in your one Zookeeper cluster. All right, the, um, the API of Zookeeper looks like a file system, some level, so it's got a, a directory hierarchy, you know, there's a root directory, and then maybe you could, maybe each application has its own subdirectory, so maybe application one keeps its files here in this directory, app two keeps its files in this directory, and you know, oops, these directories have files and directories underneath them. Um, one reason for this is just because Zookeeper, as I just mentioned, is a, designed to be shared between many possibly unrelated activities, we just need a naming system to be able to keep the information from these activities distinct so they don't get confused and read each other's data by mistake. Um, within each application, it turns out that a lot of convenient ways of using Zookeeper um, involve creating multiple files, which we'll see a couple examples like this in, um, in a few minutes. Okay, so it looks like a file system. This is you know, not very deep, it doesn't, it's not actually, you know, you can't really use it like a file system in the sense of mounting it and running ls and cat and all those things. It's just that internally it names objects with these path names. So, you know, one this, you know, we have x, y, and z here, three different files. You know, when you talk to, when you send an RPC to Zookeeper saying, you know, please read this data, you would, you would name the data you want, maybe app2 slash x. So it's just a sort of hierarchical naming scheme. Um, these, uh, these files and directories are called Z nodes, and uh, it turns out it's, there's three types you have to know about um, that help Zookeeper solve various problems for us. There's just regular Z nodes where if you create one, it's uh, permanent until you delete it. Um, there's ephemeral Z nodes where if a client creates an ephemeral Z node, um, Zookeeper will delete that ephemeral Z node if it believes that the client has died. It's actually tied to client sessions. So clients have to sort of send a little heartbeat in every once in a while into the Zookeeper, into Zookeeper, say, oh, I'm still alive, I'm still alive. So the Zookeeper won't delete their ephemeral files. Um, and the last characteristic files may have is um, sequential. And that means when you ask to create a file with a given name, what you actually end up creating is a file with that name, but with a number appended to the name. And Zookeeper guarantees never to repeat a number if multiple clients try to create sequential files at the same time, and also to always use um, mon increasing numbers for the, for the sequence numbers that it appends to file names. And we'll see all of these uh, things come up in examples. Um, at one level, the operations, the RPC interface that um, Zookeeper exposes is sort of what you might expect for, um, for files. There's a create RPC where you give it a name, really a full path name. Um, some initial data and some combination of these flags. Um, an interesting semantic of create is that it's exclusive. That is, when I send a create into Zookeeper, ask it to create a file, Zookeeper re responds with a yes or no. Um, if that file didn't exist and I'm the first client who wants to create it, Zookeeper says yes and creates the file. The file already exists. Zookeeper says no or returns an error. So clients know, you know it's exclusive create, and clients know whether they were the one client. If, if multiple clients are trying to create the same file, which we'll see in locking examples, um, the clients will know whether they were the one who actually managed to create the, uh, the file. Um, there's also delete. Um, and one thing I didn't mention is every Z node has a version, has a current version number that advances as it's modified. Um, and delete along with some other um, update operations, you can send in a version number saying, only do this operation if the file's current version number is 
the version that was specified. Um, and then that'll turn out to be helpful if you're worried about in situations where multiple clients might be trying to do the same operation at the same time. So you can pass a version saying only delete. Um, there's an exists call. And say, oh, does this path name, does this Z node exist? An interesting extra, extra argument is that you can ask to watch for changes to whatever path name you specified. You can say, does this path name exist? And whether or not exists, it exists now. If you set this watch, if you pass in true for this watch flag, Zookeeper guarantees to notify the client if anything changes about that path name, like it's created or deleted or modified. Um, and furthermore, um, the, the check for whether the file exists and the setting of the watch point, of the watching information in the inside Zookeeper are atomic. So nothing can happen between the point at which, the point in the right stream at which Zookeeper looks to see whether the path exists and the point in the right stream at which Zookeeper um, inserts the watch into its table. And that's like very important for, um, for correctness. We also have get data. You give it a path and again the watch flag. And now the watch just appears applies to the contents of that file. Um, there's set data. Boom. Again, a path. The new data. And this conditional version that if you pass in a version, then Zookeeper only actually does the write if the current version number of the file is equal to the number you passed in. Um, okay, so um, let's see how we use this. The first, maybe most, the first very simple example is supposing we have a file in Zookeeper and we want to store a number in that file and we want to be able to increment that number. So we're keeping maybe a statistics count and whenever a client, you know, I don't know, gets a request from a web user or something, it's going to increment that count in Zookeeper. Um, and more than one client may want to increment the count. That's the critical thing. Um, so. An example, a count. So one thing to sort of get out of the way is whether we actually need some specialized interface in order to support um, uh, client coordination as opposed to just data. This looks like a file system. Could we just provide the ordinary read-write kind of file system um, stuff that, data, that typical storage systems provide? So um, for example, some of you have started, and you'll all start soon, Lab 3, in which you build a key value store, where the two operations are, uh, the only operations are put key value and you know, get key, which yields the current value. So one question is, can we do you know, all these things that we might want to do with Zookeeper, can we just do them with Lab 3, with a key, with a key value put get interface? So supposing for my, I want to um, implement this count thing, Maybe I could implement the count with just lab three's key value interface. So you might uh, increment the count by saying x equals get, you know, whatever key we're using, and then put of that key an x plus one. So why, why is this a bad answer? Yes. Yeah, so it's not atomic. That is absolutely the root of the problem here. Um, and you know, there's a slightly abstract way of putting it, but um, one way of looking at it is that if two clients both want to increment the counter at the same time, they're both going to read. They're both going to use get to read the old value and get you know 10. They're both going to add 1 to 10 and get 11, and they're both going to call put with 11. So now we've increased the counter by one, but two clients were doing it. So surely we should have ended up increasing it by two. Um, so, so that's why lab three cannot be used for even this simple example. Um, furthermore, in the sort of zookeeper world where gets can return stale data, this is not lab three, where gets are not allowed to return stale data. But in zookeeper, reads can be stale. And so if you read a stale version of the current counter and add one to it, you're now writing the wrong value. <clears throat> you know, if the up to date value is 11, <clears throat> but your get returns a stale value of 10, 
you add one to that and put 11, that's a mistake because we really should have been putting 12. So Zookeeper has this additional problem that we have to worry about that um, the gets uh, don't return the latest data. Um, okay, so how would you do this in Zookeeper? Um, here's how I would do this in Zookeeper. Um, turns out you need to do, you need to wrap uh, this code sequence in a loop because it's not guaranteed to succeed the first time. So we're just gonna say while while true. Um, we're gonna call get data to get the current value of the counter and the current version. So we're gonna say x v equals um, get data. And we need to say a file name. I don't care what the file name is. We'll just say f. Right, so now we get the, well, we get a value and a version number. Possibly not fresh, possibly stale, but maybe fresh. Um, and then we're gonna use a conditional put, a conditional set data. Um, and if set data, the set data operation returned true, meaning it actually did set the uh, value, we're gonna break. Otherwise, just go back to the top of the loop. Right, otherwise. Um, so what's going on here is that we read some value and some version number, maybe stale, maybe fresh, out of the replica. The set data we send actually to the zookeeper leader, because all writes go to the leader. And what this means is only set the value to x plus one if the version but the real version, the latest version, is still, is V. Um, so if we read fresh data and nothing else is going on in the system, like no other clients are trying to increment this, then we'll read the latest version, the latest value, we'll add one to the latest value, specify the latest version, and our set data will be accepted by the leader and we'll um, get back a positive re reply to our uh, request after it's committed um, and we'll break because we're done. If we got stale data here, or this was fresh data, but by the time our set data got to the leader, some other client's set data, you know, some other client who's trying to increment, their set data got there before us, our version number will no longer be fresh in either of those cases. This set data will fail, and we'll get an error response back. It won't break out of the loop, and we'll go back and try again. And hopefully we'll succeed this time. Yes. Is it possible that we could actually never succeed because of the ordering of other clients constantly changing? Yeah, so the question is could this, you know, it's a while loop. Are we guaranteed it's ever going to finish? And no, no, we're not really guaranteed it's ever going to finish. In practice, um, you know, so for example, if our replica we're reading from is cut off from the leader, and permanently gives us stale data, then you know, maybe this is not gonna work out. Um, but, you know, in, but in real life, the, well, in real life, the you know, leader's pushing all the replicas towards having identical data to the leader. So you know, if we just got stale data here, probably when we go back, you know, maybe we should sleep for 10 milliseconds or something at this point, but um, when we go back here, eventually we're gonna see the latest data. The situation under which this might genuinely be pretty bad news is if there's a very high continuous load of increments from clients. You know, if we have a thousand clients all trying to do increments, um, the risk is that maybe none of them will succeed. So I'm not, I think one of them will succeed, because I think one of them will succeed. Um, because, you know, the, the first one that gets its set data into the leader will succeed and the rest will all fail because their version numbers are all too low. And then the next 999 will put send and get data's in and one of them will succeed. So it all have a sort of n squared complexity to get through all of the, um, all of the clients, which is very damaging, but it will finish eventually. And so if you thought you were gonna have a lot of clients, you would use a different strategy here. Um, this is good for low load situations.
Yes. If they fit in memory, it's no problem. If they don't fit in memory, it's a disaster. So yeah, when you're using Zookeeper, you, sort of, you, know, you have to keep in mind that it's, you know, it's great for 100 megabytes of stuff and probably terrible for 100 gigabytes of stuff. So that's why people think of it as storing configuration information rather than the real data of your big website. Yes? You mean insert a watch into this sequence? Yeah, that could be. So, um, if we want, if we wanted to fix this to work under high load, then um, uh, you would certainly want to sleep at this point. Or uh, I'm not. Well, the way I would fix this, <laughs> my instinct on fixing this would be to insert a sleep here. And furthermore, uh, double the amount of, and sort of randomized sleep whose span of randomness doubles each time we fail. And that's a sort of tried and true strategy. This exponential back off is a, it's actually similar to raft leader election. It's a reasonable strategy for adapting to an unknown number of concurrent clients. So, okay, tell me what to write. Okay, so we're getting data and then watch equals true. So, so yeah, so, so if somebody else modifies the data before you call set data, maybe you'll get a watch notification. Um, the problem is the timing is not working in your favor. Like the amount of time between when I receive the data here and when I send off the message to the leader with this new set data is, is zero. That's how much time will pass here, um, roughly. And if some other client has sent in an increment at about this time, it's actually quite a long time between when that client sends in the increment and when it works its way through the leader and is sent out to the followers and actually executed to the followers and the followers look it up in their watch table and send me a notification. So I think. The, um, it won't give you any read result, <laughs> or if you read at a point, if you're gonna read at a point that's after where the modification occurred that should raise the watch, you'll get the notification of the watch before you get the read response. But in any case, I think nothing like this could save us because what's gonna happen is all thousand clients are gonna do the same thing, whatever it is. Right? They're all going to do a get and set a watch and whatever. They're all going to get the notification at the same time. They're all going to make the same decision about, um, well, they're all not going to get the watch because none of them has done the put data yet. Right? So, so the worst case is all the clients are starting at the same point. They all do a get. They all get version one. They all set a watch point. They don't get a notification because no change has occurred. They all send a set data RPC to the leader, all thousand of them. The first one changes the data, and now the other 999 get a notification when it's too late because they've already sent the set data. So, so it's possible that Watch could help us here, but, but the sort of straightforward version of Watch. Um, I, I have a feeling if you want the, the um, maybe we'll talk about this in a few minutes, but the, um, the non-herd, the second locking example absolutely solves this kind of problem. So we could adapt the second locking example from the paper to try to cause the increments to happen one at a time if there's a huge number of uh, clients who want to do it. Other questions about this example? Okay, this is an example of a, um, what many people call a mini transaction. 
All right? It's transactional in a sense that while there's you know, a lot of funny stuff happening here, the effect is that um, you know, once it all succeeds, we have achieved an atomic read, modify, write of the counter. Right? The, the difficulty here is that it's not atomic. The read and the write, the read, the modify, and the write are not atomic. The thing that we have pulled off here is that this sequence, once it finishes, is atomic. Right? We actually manage, once we, after we, on the pass through this that we succeeded, we managed to read, increment, and write without anything else intervening. We managed to do these three steps atomically. Um, and, you know, this is not because this isn't a full database transaction, like real databases allow fully general transactions where you can say start transaction and then read or write anything you like, maybe thousands of different data items, whatever, who knows what, and then say end transaction and the database will cleverly commit the whole thing as an atomic transaction. So real transactions can be very complicated. Zookeeper supports this extremely simplified version of you know, when you're sort of one, we can do it atomic, sort of operations on one piece of data. Um, but it's enough to get increment and some other things. So these are, for that reason, since they're not general, but they do provide atomicity, these are often called mini transactions. Um, and it turns out this pattern can be made to work with um, various other things too. Like if we wanted to do the test and set that VMware FT requires, um, it can be implemented with very much this setup. You know, we read the old value. Um, if it's zero, then we try to set it to one, but give this version number. You know, if nobody else intervened, and we were the one who actually managed to set it to one because the version number hadn't changed by the time the leader got our request, then we win. If somebody else changes it to one after we read it, then the leader will tell us that we lost. So you can do test and set with this pattern also. And you should remember this, this strategy. Okay. All right. Um, next example I want to talk about is, is locks. And I'm talking about this because it's in the paper, not because I strongly believe that this kind of lock is useful. Um, but they have, um, they have an example in which a choir As a couple steps. Um, one, we try to create, we have a lock file, and uh, we try to create the lock file, you know, again, some file, um, with ephemeral set to true. And so if that succeeds, then we're done. We've acquired the lock. Um, the second step, that doesn't succeed, um, then we want to wait for whoever did acquire the lock. But if, if this isn't true, that means the lock file already exists. That means somebody else has acquired the lock, and so we want to wait for them to release the lock. And they're going to release the lock by deleting this file. So we want to watch. Yes? Oh, yeah, you're right. Sorry about that. Um, all right, so we want to watch, we want to add, and a call exists. Um, and uh, with watch equals true. Now, it turns out that, um, okay, and, and, and if the file still exists, right, which we expect it to, because after all, if it didn't exist, presumably it would have returned here. So if it exists, we want to wait for the notification. All right, we're waiting for this watch notification. Um, Call this step three and a step four. Um, go to one. Um, so the usual deal is, you know, we call create. You know, maybe we win. Um, if it fails, we wait for whoever owns the lock to release it. We get the watch notification when the file's deleted. At that point, this wait finishes, and we go back to one and try to recreate the file. Hopefully, we'll get the file this time. Um, Okay, so we should ask ourselves questions about possible interleavings of other clients' activities with our four steps. So one we know, for sh we know of already, if another client calls create at the same time, 
um, then the zookeeper leader is gonna process those two, two create RPCs one at a time in some order. So either my create will be executed first or the other client's create will be executed first. And if mine's executed first, I'm gonna get a true back in return and acquire the lock and the other client is guaranteed to get a false return. And if their RPC is processed first, they'll get the true return and I'm guaranteed to get the false return. And in either case, the file will be created. So we're okay if um, we have simultaneous uh, executions of one. Um, another question is, well, you know, if I, if create doesn't succeed for me and I'm gonna call exist, what happens if the lock is released actually between the create and the exists? Um, so this is the reason why I wrap, why I have an if around the, around the exists is because it actually might be released before I call exists, um, you know, because it could have been acquired quite a long time ago by some other client. And then if the file doesn't exist at this point, then this will fail and I'll just go directly back to this go to one and try again. Um, similarly, and actually more interesting is what happens if the, um, whoever holds it now releases it just as I call exist or as the replica I'm talking to is in the middle of processing my exists request. And the answer to that is that the, whatever replica I'm looking at, you know, it's log, um, we're guaranteed that writes occur in some order, right? So the replica I'm talking to, it's, it's log, it's proceeding in some way and my exists call is guaranteed to be executed between two log entries in the write stream, right? This is a, this is a read-only request, and, you know, the problem is that somebody's delete request is being processed at about this time. So somewhere in the log um, is going, is or is going to be the delete request from the other client. And the rep, and, you know, so this is my, my, the replica that I'm talking, the Zookeeper replica I'm talking to is log. My watch, my exists RPC is either processed, completely processed here, in which case the replica sees, oh, the file still exists, and the replica inserts the watch information into its watch table at this point, and only then executes the delete. So when the delete comes in, we're guaranteed that my watch request is in the replica's watch table, and it will send me a notification, right? Or my exist request is executed here at a point after the delete happened, the file doesn't exist, and so now the call returns true and no, well, actually a watch table entry is entered, but we don't care. Right, so it's quite important that the writes are sequenced and that reads happen um, at definite points uh, between writes. Yes. So if the exists call happens after the delete, so the case is on on the board, um, then the watch notification will be sent when the file is created. Well, okay, so. So this is where the exists is executed. The file doesn't exist at this point. Exists returns false. We don't wait. We go to one. We create the file and return. We did install a watch here. That watch will be triggered. It doesn't really matter because we're not really waiting for it, but the watch will be triggered by this create. But what if someone else then created the watch is triggered? We're not waiting for it, <laughs> but yeah. Okay, so the file doesn't exist, we go to one, somebody else has created the file, we try to create the file, that fails, we install another watch, and it's this watch that we're now waiting for. So this wait is not a wait for anything to happen, although it doesn't really matter, and well, it's, it's not harmful to, to, to break out of this loop early, it's just wasteful. Anyway, we will, this, this, this code leaves watches sort of in the system, and I don't really know what, does my new watch on the same file override my old watch? I'm not actually sure, for Zookeeper. Okay, um, finally, 
this example and the previous example suffer, suffer from the herd effect. We also heard effect. We talked about, I mean, what we were talking about when we were worrying about, oh, what if a thousand clients all try to increment this at the same time? Gosh, that's gonna have N squared complexity um, as far as how long it takes to get through all thousand clients. This lock scheme also suffers from the herd effect in that if there are a thousand clients trying to get the lock, then the amount of time that's required to sort of grant the lock to each one of the thousand clients is proportional to a thousand squared because after every release, all of the remaining clients get triggered by this watch. All of the remaining clients go back up here and send in a create. And so the total number of create RPCs generated is basically a thousand squared. Um, so this suffers from this um, herd effect, the whole herd of waiting clients. Um, is beating on Zookeeper. Uh, another name for this is that it's a non-scalable lock. Or, yeah. Okay, and so the paper, I mean, this, this is a real deal, and we'll, we'll see it more in, in other systems. Um, and a serious enough, pro serious enough problem that the paper actually talks about how to solve it using Zookeeper. And the interesting thing is that Zookeeper is actually expressive enough um, to be able to, <clears throat> Uh, build a, a, a more complex lock scheme that doesn't suffer from this herd effect. That even if a thousand clients are waiting, um, the cost of one client giving up a lock and another acquiring it is order one instead of um, order n. And this is the, uh, because it's a little bit complex, this is the um, uh, pseudocode in the paper in section 2.4. It's on page six if you want to follow along. So this is, um, lock without herd effect. And so this time there is not a single lock file. Um, there's no, oh, I'm sorry, yes. It is just a name that allows us to all talk about the same lock. Okay. So. It's just a name. And then what's after? Like you've acquired the lock, now you can release some other file? No, now I've acquired the lock and I can do, I can, whatever the lock was protecting. Okay. You know, maybe only one of us at a time should be allowed to give a lecture in this lecture hall. Okay. If you want to give a lecture in this lecture hall, you first have to acquire the lock called 34100. Um, the, that that's, turns out is yes, it's a Z node in Zookeeper, but it's like nobody cares about its contents. We just need it to be able to agree on a name for the lock. That's the sense in which that's file, it looks like a file system, but it's really a naming system. <clears throat> All right. Um, so step one is we create a, a sequential file. Um, and so, yeah, we give it a prefix name, but what it actually creates is, um, you know, if this is the 27th, file, sequential file created with, with prefix f, you know, maybe we get f27 uh, or something. Um, and, and in the sequenced, in the sequence of writes that Zookeeper is, is working through, um, successive creates get ascending, guaranteed ascending, never descending, always ascending sequence numbers when you create a sequential file. Um, uh, there was an operation I left off from the list. It turns out you can get a list of files. Um, you can get a list of files underneath a, uh, if you give it the name of a, a Z node that's actually a directory with files in it, you can get a list of all the files that are currently in that directory. So we're gonna list the files that start with F. You know, maybe you know, list F star. We get some lists back. Um, we created a file with the system allocated us a number here. We're gonna look at that number. If there's no lower numbered file in this list, then we win and we get the lock. So if our sequential file is the lowest number file um, with that name prefix, we win. So if there's no lower number, we 
we acquire the lock and we can return. Um, if there is one, then again, what we want to wait for, then th um, what's going on is that th these sequentially numbered files are setting up the order in which the lock is going to be granted to the different clients. So if we're not the winner of the lock, what we need to do is wait for the previously numbered, the uh, client who created the previously numbered file to release, to acquire and then release the lock. And we're going to release the lock. Um, the convention for releasing the locking in this system is, is for, to remove the file, to remove your sequential file. So we want to wait for the previously numbered sequential file to be deleted. And then it's our turn and we get the lock. So we need to um, call exists. So we're going to say if, we're going to call exists mostly to set a watch point. Um, so it's, you know, next lower number file. Um, and we want to have a watch. If that file still exists, we're going to wait. And then, um, so that's step five. And then finally, we're going to go back to, uh, we're not going to create the file again because it already exists. We're going to go back to listing the, uh, the files. So this is acquire. Release is just um, I delete. If I acquire the lock, I delete my, the file I created, complete with my number. Um, yes? Why do you need to go back to list the files? Why do you need to list the files again? That's a good question. So the question is, we got the list of files. Um, we know the next lower number file. The, the guarantee of this sequential file creation is that once file 27 is created, no file with a lower number will ever subsequently be created. So we now know nothing else could sneak in here. So how could the next lower number file, you know, why, why do we need to list again? Why don't we just go back to waiting for that same lower numbered file? Um, anybody guess the answer? I mean, the, the, the way this code works, the answer to the question is, whoever was the next lowered person might have either acquired and released the lock before we noticed, or have died. And, this went, and these are transient files. Sorry. <laughs> or whatever they're called. Uh, ephemeral. This is an ephemeral file. Um, you know, even if we're 27th in line, number 26 may have died before getting the lock. If number 26 dies, the system automatically deletes their ephemeral files. And so if that happened, now we need to wait for number 25. That is the next, you know, if, if all files, you know, two through 27, and we're 27, if they're all there and they're all waiting for the lock, if, if the one before us dies before getting the lock, now we need to wait for the next, next lower number file, not because the next lower one has, has gone away. So that's why we have to go back and relist the files in case our predecessor in the list of waiting clients um, turn out to die. Yes? If there's no lower numbered file, then you have acquired the lock. Um, absolutely. Yes? Can you explain how this does not suffer from the herd effect? How does this not suffer from the herd effect? Um, you know, suppose we have 1,000 clients waiting, and currently client, we made through the first 500, and client 500 holds the lock. Um, every client's waiting. Every client is sitting here waiting for an event, but only the client that created file 501 is waiting for the deletion of file 500. So everybody's waiting for the next lower number. So 500 is waiting for 499, 499 is, or whatever, Everybody, <clears throat> everybody's waiting for just one file. When I release the lock, there's only one other client, the next higher numbered client, that's waiting for my file. So when I release the lock, one client gets a notification, one client goes back and lists the files. One client 
and one client now has the lock. So the sort of expense, you know, no matter how many clients there are, the expense of one of each release and acquire is a constant number of, of RPCs. Whereas the expense of <clears throat> a release and acquire here is that every single waiting client is notified and every single one of them sends a write request, sends a create request into Zookeeper. Oh, you're free to get a cup of coffee. Yeah, I mean, this is, you know, what, what the programming interface looks like is not our business. But this is either, and there, there, there's two options for what this actually means as far as what the program looks like. One is there's some thread that's actually in a synchronous wait. It's, it's made a function call saying, please acquire this lock, and the function call doesn't return until the lock's finally acquired, or, or the notification comes back. A much more sophisticated interface would be in one in which you fire off requests to Zookeeper and don't wait, and then separately there's some way of seeing, well, has Zookeeper said anything recently? Or have some go routine whose job it is to just wait for the next whatever it is from Zookeeper, in the same sense that you might read the apply channel and just all kinds of interesting stuff comes up on the apply channel. So that's a more likely uh, way to structure this. But yeah, you're totally, either through threading or some sort of event-driven thing, you can do something else while you're waiting. Yes? Does that exist saying if the person before me has the lock, you then wait for them to release it? Yes. If it's in the or, or if the person before me has neither died nor released. If the file before me exists, that means either that client is still alive and still waiting for the lock, or still alive and holds the lock. We don't really know. It does, it, as long as that client 500 is still alive. If, if, if this exists fails, that means one of two things. Either my predecessor held the lock and has released it and deleted their file, or my predecessor didn't hold the lock, they exited, and Zookeeper deleted their file because it was an ephemeral file. So there's, there's two reasons to come out of this, ex, to come out of this wait, or for the exist to return false. And that's why we have to like recheck everything uh, you know, we really don't know what the situation is after the exists completes. Yeah. That might, that, yeah, maybe, maybe that could be made to work. That sounds reasonable. Um, and it preserves the, sort of scalable nature of this and that each acquire and release only involves a few clients, two clients. All right, this pattern to me, um, I actually first saw this pattern in a totally different context in scalable locks for threading systems like Go. This and in, uh, in for most of the world, this is called a scalable lock. Um, Um, I find it one of the most interesting constructions <laughs> I've ever seen. Um, now, and, and so, like, I'm impressed that Zookeeper is able to express it, um, and it's a valuable construct. Um, having said that, I'm a little bit at sea about why Zookeeper, about why the paper talks about locks at all. Um, because these locks, um, these locks are not like threading locks in Go. Because in threading, there's no notion of threads failing, at least if you don't want them there to be. There's no notions of threads just sort of randomly dying in Go. And so really the only thing you're getting out of a mutex, it is really the case in Go that when you use it, if everybody uses mutexes correctly, you are getting atomicity for the sequence of operations inside the mutex. Or that, you know, if you 
take out a lock and go, and you do 47 different read and write a lot of variables and then release the lock. If everybody follows that locking strategy, um, nobody's ever going to see some sort of weird intermediate version of the data as of halfway through you were updating it. Right? Just makes things atomic, no argument. These locks aren't really like that because if the client that holds the lock fails, it just releases the lock and somebody else can pick up the lock. So it does not guarantee atomicity um, because you can get partial failures in distributed systems where you don't really get partial failures of ordinary threaded code. Um, so if the current lock holder had the lock and needed to update a whole bunch of things that were protected by that lock before releasing and only got halfway through updating this stuff and then crashed, then the lock will get released, you'll get the lock, and yet when you go to look at the data, it's garbage because it's just whatever random state it was in the middle of being updated. Um, so there's, these locks don't by themselves provide the same atomicity guarantee that threading locks do. And so we're sort of left to imagine for ourselves by the paper why you would want to use them or why this is the sort of some of the main examples in the paper. Um, so I think if you use locks like this, then you sort of in a distributed system, you have two general options. One is everybody who acquires a lock has to be prepared to clean up from some previous disaster. Right, so you acquire this lock, you look at the data, you try to figure out, gosh, if the previous owner of the lock crashed, you know, when I'm looking at the data, you know, how can I fix the data to make up? How can I decide if the previous owner crashed? And what do I do to fix up the data? And you can play that game, um, especially if the convention is that you always update in a particular sequence. You may be able to detect where in that sequence the previous holder crashed, assuming they crashed. Um, but it's a, you know, it's a tricky game that requires thought of a kind you don't need for like thread locking. Um, the other reason maybe that these locks would make sense is if they're sort of soft locks um, protecting something that doesn't really matter. So for example, if you're running map reduce jobs, map tasks, reduce tasks, um, you could use this kind of lock to make sure only one uh, task, only one worker executed each task. So, Worker is going to run task 37, it gets the lock for task 37, executes it, marks it as executed, and releases it. Well, <clears throat> the way MapReduce works, it's actually proof against crashed workers anyway. Um, so if you grab a lock and you crash halfway through your map or reduce job, so what? The next person who gets the lock, you know, because your lock will be released when you crash, the next person who gets it will see you didn't finish the task and just re-execute it. And it's just not a problem because of the way MapReduce is defined. Um, so you could use these locks for some kind of soft lock thing. Although, well, anyway. The, and you know, maybe the other thing which we should be thinking about is that some version of this could be used to uh, do things like elect a master. But if what we're really doing here is electing a master, you know, we could use code much like this, and that would probably be a reasonable approach. Yeah. Oh yeah, like yeah, yeah. So the you know the paper talk. The, you remember the text in the paper where it says it's going to delete the ready file and then do a bunch of updates to files and then recreate the ready file. That would that is a fantastic way of sort of detecting and coping with the possibility that the previous lock holder or the previous master or whoever it is crashed halfway through because gosh the ready file is never recreated. In a Go program. Yeah, sadly, that is possible. And, you know, either, okay, so the question is nothing about Zookeeper, but if you're writing threaded code in Go, a thread acquires a lock, could it crash while holding the lock halfway through whatever stuff it's supposed to be doing while holding the lock? And the answer is yes, actually. There are, there are ways for an individual thread to crash in Go, although I forget what they are. Maybe divide by zero in certain panics. Anyway, you can do it. Um, and my advice about how to think about that is that the program's now broken and you've got to kill it. Because 
in threaded code, the way to think about locks is that while the lock is held, the invariants in the data don't hold. So there's no way to proceed if the lock holder crashes. There's no safe way to proceed because all you know is whatever the invariants were that the lock was protecting no longer hold. So, and, so, and if you do want to proceed, you have to leave the lock marked as held so that no one else will ever be able to acquire it. Um, and you know, unless you have some cleverer idea, that's pretty much the way you have to think about it in a threaded program because that's kind of the style with which people write threaded locked programs. If you're super clever, you could play the same kinds of tricks like this ready flag trick. Now, it's super hard in Go because the memory model says there is nothing you can count on except if there's a happens before relationship. So if you play this game of writing, changing some variables and then setting a done flag, that doesn't mean anything un unless you release a lock and somebody else acquires a lock and only then can anything be said about the order in which or in even whether the updates happened. So this is very, very hard. It would be very hard in Go to recover from a crash of a thread that holds the lock. Um, here, this may be a little more plausible. Okay. Okay. Um, Okay, so that's all I want to talk about with, with Zookeeper. Um, it's just two pieces of high bid. One is they have these clever ideas for high performance by reading from any replica, but the, uh, they sacrifice a bit of consistency. Um, and the other interesting thing, interesting take home is that they worked out this API that really does let them um, be a general purpose sort of coordination service in a way that simpler schemes like put get interfaces just can't do. So they worked out a set of uh, functions here that allows you to do things like write, write mini transactions and build your own locks. Um, and it all works out, although it requires care. Okay, now um, I want to turn to today's paper, which is crack. Um, the, um, the reason why we're reading a crack paper, there's a couple reasons. Um, one is, is that it's it does replication for fault tolerance. And as we'll see, the properties you get out of um, crack or its predecessor chain replication are very different um, in interesting ways from the properties you get out of a system like raft. Um, and so I'm actually going to talk about, so crack is sort of an optimization to an older scheme called chain replication. Um, Chain replication is actually fairly frequently used in the real world. There's a bunch of systems that use it. Um, crack is an optimization to it that actually does a similar trick to Zookeeper, where it's trying to increase read throughput by allowing reads to um, to replicas, to any replica. So you get you know number of replicas, factor of increase in the read performance. Um, the interesting thing about crack is that it does that while preserving linearizability. Unlike Zookeeper, which, you know, it seemed like in order to be able to read from any replica, they had to sacrifice freshness, and therefore it's not linearizable. Uh, Crack actually manages to uh, do these reads from any replica uh, while preserving strong consistency, uh, which is pretty interesting. Okay, so first I want to talk about the older system chain replication. Uh, chain replication is a, um, it's just a scheme for, you have multiple copies, you want to make sure they all see in the same sequence of writes. So it's like a very familiar basic idea. Um, it, but it's a different topology than raft. So um, the idea is that there's uh, a chain of servers in chain replication. Um, and the first one's called the head. And the last one's called the tail. When a write comes in, when a client wants to write something, so there's some client, um, it sends always, all writes get sent to the head. The head updates its, or replaces its current copy of the data that the client's writing. So you can imagine being a put get key value store. Um, so, uh, you know, if everybody started out with, you know, version A of the data, then under chain replication, 
when the head processes the write, and maybe we're writing value B, you know, the head just replaces this A with a B and passes the write down the chain. And as each uh, node sees the write, it replaces, overwrites its copy of the data um, with the new data. When the write gets to the tail, the tail sends the reply back to the client saying, we completed your write. Um, that's how writes work. Reads, um, if a client wants to do a read, it sends the read to the tail, the read requests to the tail, and the tail just answers out of its current state. So if we ask for this, whatever this uh, object was, the tail would just say, oh, current value is B. Um, so reads are a good deal simpler. Um, Okay, so we should think for a moment, like why, uh, so chain, chain replication, so this is not crack, just to be clear, this is chain replication. Chain replication is linearizable. Um, you know, in the absence of failures, what's going on is that we can essentially view it as really, from the purposes of thinking about uh, consistency, it's just this one server. This server sees all the writes, and it sees all the reads, it processes them one at a time, and you know, a read will just see the latest value that's written, and that's pretty much all there is to it from the point of view of uh, if there's no crashes, what the consistency is like. Um, pretty simple. Uh, the failure recovery, um, the, a lot of the, re the rationale behind chain replication is that the uh, set of states you can see when after there's a failure is relatively constrained because of this very regular pattern with how the writes get propagated. Um, and at a high level, what's going on is that any committed write, that is any write that could have been acknowledged to a client, to the writing client, or any write that could have been exposed in a read, that'll, neither of those will ever happen unless that write reached the tail. In order for it to reach the tail, it had to have passed through and been processed by every single node in the chain. So we know that if we ever exposed a write, ever acknowledged a write, ever yielded it to a read, that means every single node in the tail must know about that write. Um, we don't get these situations like if you recall figure seven, figure eight, and the raft paper where you can have just hair raising complexity in how the different replicas differ if there's a crash. Here, you know, um, either the data is committed or it, before the crash it reached some point and nowhere after that point because the progress of rights is always linear. So committed rights are always known everywhere. If a right isn't committed, that means that before whatever crash it was that disturbed the system, the right had gotten to a certain point everywhere before that point and nowhere after that point. And those are really the only two setups. Um, and at a high level, Failure recovery is uh, relatively simple also. Um, if the head fails, then to a first approximation, the next node can simply take over his head and nothing else needs to get done. Um, because any write that made it as far as the second node, well, it was the head that failed, so that write will keep on going and will commit. Um, if there's a write that made it to the head before it crashed, but the head didn't forward it, well, that's definitely not committed, nobody knows about it, and we definitely didn't send it an acknowledgement to the writing client because the write didn't get down here. So we're not obliged to do anything about a write that only reached a crashed head before it failed. And maybe the client will resend, but you know, not our problem. Um, if the tail fails, it's actually very similar. If the tail fails, the next node can directly take over because everything the tail knew, the next, the node just before it also knows, because the tail only hears things from the node just before it. Um, and um, it's a little bit complex if an intermediate node fails, but basically what needs to be done is we need to drop it from the chain, and now there may be writes that it had received that the next node hasn't received yet. Um, and so if we drop a node out of the chain, the predecessor may need to resend recent writes to, the, uh, to its new successor. That's the recovery in a nutshell. Um, as for why this construction, um, why this instead of something else, like why this versus wrap, for example, um, the performance reason is that in raft, if you recall, we, you know, if we have a 
a leader and a bunch of, you know, some number of replicas, right? We have the leader, it's not in a chain, we got these, the replicas are all directly fed by the leader. So if a client write comes in, or a client read for that matter, the, um, the leader has to send it itself to each of the replicas. Whereas in chain replication, the leader only, the head only has to do one send. These sends on the network are actually reasonably expensive. Um, and so that means the load on a raft leader is going to be higher than the load on a chain replication leader. Um, and so that means that, you know, as the um, number of client requests per second that you're getting from clients goes up, a raft leader will hit a limit and stop being able to get faster sooner than a, a chain replication head because it's doing more work than the chain replication head. Um, another interesting difference between uh, chain replication and raft is that the, re the reads in um, raft are all also required to be processed by the leader. So the leader sees every single request from a client, whereas here, the head sees, everybody sees all the writes, um, but only the tail sees the uh, read requests. So there may be an extent to which the load is sort of split between the head and the tail, rather than uh, concentrated in the leader. Um, and, yeah, um, and as I mentioned before, the failure, different sort of the analysis required to think about different failure scenarios is a good deal simpler in chain replication than it is in um, raft, and has a big motivation because it's hard to get this stuff correct. Yes. Yeah, so if the tail fails, but its predecessor had seen a write that the tail hadn't seen, then the failure of the tail basically commits that write. It is now committed because it's reached the new tail. And so it could respond to the client. It probably won't because it, you know, it wasn't tail when it received the write. Um, and so the client may resend the write, and that's too bad, and so we need duplicate suppression probably at the head. Um, I'm basically, all the systems we're talking about require, in addition to everything else, suppression of duplicate client requests. Yes? Can, sorry, can you say it again? You want to know who makes the decisions about how to, how to that's a, Outstanding question. <laughs> so the question is, um, or I'll rephrase the question a bit. If there's a failure, like, or suppose the second node stops being able to talk to the head, can this second node just take over? Can it decide for itself, gosh, the head seems to have gone away. I'm going to take over his head and tell clients to talk to me instead of the old head. So what do you think? Does that sound like a plan? Um, with the usual assumptions we make about how the network behaves, um, that's a recipe for split brain, right, if you do exactly what I said. Because, of course, what really happened was that, oh, the network failed here, the head is totally alive, and the head thinks its successor has died. You know, the successor is actually alive, it thinks the head has died. And they both say, well, gosh, that other server seems to have died, I'm going to take over. And the head is going to say, oh, I'll just be a sole replica, and I, you know, I'll act as the head and the tail, because the rest of the chain seems to have gone away, and the second node will do the same thing. And now we have two independent split brain versions of the data, which will gradually get out of sync. Um, so this construction is not proof against network partition, and has not, does not have a defense against split brain. And what that means in practice is that it cannot be used by itself. It's like a helpful thing to have in our back pocket, but it's not a complete replication story. Um, so it's, it's very commonly used, but it's used in this stylized way in which there's always an external authority, you know, not, not this chain, that decides who's, that sort of makes a call on who's alive and who's dead. Um, and make sure everybody agrees on a single story about who constitutes the chain. So there's never any disagreement. Some people think the chain is this node. Some people think the chain is this other node. Um, and so what's that's usually called is a configuration manager. Um, 
and it's, its job is just to monitor liveness, and every time it sees, of all the servers, every time, it's, every time the configuration manager thinks a server's dead, it sends out a new configuration in which, you know, this, this chain has a new definition, head, whatever, tail. And that server that the configuration manager thinks is dead may or may not be dead, but we don't care because everybody is required to follow the new configuration. Um, and so there can't be any disagreement because there's only one party making these decisions. It's not gonna disagree with itself. Of course, how do you make a service that's fault tolerant and doesn't disagree with itself? It doesn't suffer from split brain if there's network partitions. And the answer to that is that the configuration manager usually uses RAF or Paxos or in the case of Crack, Zookeeper, which itself, of course, is built on a RAF-like scheme. Um, so, so, you, so the usual complete setup in your data center is that you have a configuration manager that's based on RAF or Paxos or whatever, so it's fault tolerant and does not suffer from split brain. And then you split up your data over a bunch of chains. You have you know, a room with 1,000 servers in it, and you have you know, chain A, um, you know, it's these servers, or the, the configuration manager decides that the chains should look like chain A is made of server one, server two, server three, chain B, you know, server four, server five, server six, whatever, and it tells everybody this whole list. And so all the clients know, all the servers know, and the uh, individual server's opinions about whether other servers are alive or dead are totally neither here nor there. Um, if this server really does die, then, then the head is required to keep trying indefinitely until it gets a new configuration from the configuration manager. They are not allowed to make decisions about who's alive and who's dead. What's that? Oh boy, you got a serious problem. So that's why you replicate it using raft make sure the different replicas are on different power supplies, the whole works. Um, but this, this construction I've set up here is extremely common and is how chain replication is intended to be used, how crack is intended to be used. Um, and the logic of it is that um, like chain uh, replication, if you don't have to worry about partition and split brain, you can build very high speed efficient replication systems using chain replication for example. So these individual you know, data replication, you know, we're sharding the data over many chains. Individually, this, these chains can be built to be just the most efficient scheme for the particular kind of thing that you're replicating. You may read heavy, write heavy, whatever. Um, but we don't have to worry too much about partitions and then all that worry is concentrated in the reliable non-split brain configuration manager. Yeah. Okay, so your, your question is, um, why are we using chain replication here instead of raft? Yeah, because it's easier because it's easier for the configuration manager anyway. Okay, so that's like a totally reasonable question. Um, the, the, it doesn't really matter for this construction because even if we're using raft here, we still need one party to make a decision with which there can be no disagreement about how the data is divided over our 100 different replication groups. Right? So all of, you know, in any kind of big system, you're splitting it, you're sharding or splitting up the data. Somebody needs to decide how the data is assigned to the different replication groups, which has to change over time as you get more or less hardware, or more data or whatever. So if nothing else, the configuration manager is saying, well, look, you know, the keys start with A or B goes here, then C or D goes here. Um, even if you use Paxos here. Now, there's also this smaller question of within each, you know, what should we use for replication? Should it be chain replication or Paxos or Raft or whatever? Um, and uh, people do different things. Um, some people do actually use Paxos-based replication, like Spanner, which I think we're gonna look at later in the uh, semester, has this structure, but it actually uses Paxos to replicate writes for the data. Um, you know, the reason why you might not want to use Paxos or Raft is that um, it's arguably more efficient to use this chain construction because it reduces the load on the reader. 
then that may or may not be a critical issue. Um, the, a reason to favor Raft or Paxos is that they do not have to wait for a lagging replica. This chain replication has a performance problem that if one of these replicas is slow, because even for a moment, you know, because every write has to go through every replica, even a single slow replica slows down all, oper all write operations. And that can be very damaging in a, you know, if you have thousands of servers, probably at any given time, you know, seven of them are out to lunch or unreliable or slow because somebody's installing new software, who knows what. Um, and that, so it's a bit damaging uh, to have every request be sort of limited by the slowest server. Whereas Raft and Paxos, um, well, it's, so Raft, for example, if one of the followers is slow, it doesn't matter because the leader only has to wait for a majority. It doesn't have to wait for all of them. You know, ultimately, they all have to catch up, but Raft is much better uh, resisting transient slowdown. And some Paxos-based systems, although not really Raft, are also good at um, dealing with the possibility that the replicas are in different data centers and may be far from each other. And because you only need a majority, you don't have to necessarily wait for acknowledgments from a distant data center. And so that can also lead people to use Paxos Raft-like majority schemes rather than chain replication. But this is sort of a, you know, it depends very much on your workload and what you're trying to achieve. But this overall architecture is, uh, in, uh, I don't know if it's universal, but it's extremely common. Yes? Are there, are there network topologies where, uh, let's say, two nodes in the chain are, in fact, able to contact the configuring, configuration manager and also the reverse, but these two nodes cannot talk to each other? Are, uh, like intentional topologies? For, um, okay, the, for, a, for a network that's not broken, the usual assumption is that all the computers can talk to each other through the network. For networks that are broken, because somebody stepped on a cable or some router is misconfigured, any crazy thing can happen. So absolutely, due to misconfiguration, you can get a situation where, you know, these two nodes can talk to the configuration manager and the configuration manager thinks they're, they're up, but they can't talk to each other. So, yes. <laughs> And, and that's a killer for this, right? Because, oh, the configuration manager thinks they're up, they can't talk to each other. Boy, it's just like, it's a disaster. Um, and, and if you need your system to be resistant to that, then you need to have a more careful configuration manager. You need, we need logic in the configuration manager that says, gosh, I'm only gonna form a chain out of these services. Not only I can talk to them, but they can talk to each other and sort of explicitly check. And I don't know if that's common, I'm, I'm gonna guess not. Um, but if you were super careful, you'd want to. Because even though we talk about network partition, that's like an abstraction. And in reality, you can get any combination of who can talk to who else. And some are maybe very damaging. Okay. Um, I'm going to wrap up and see you next week. <laughs>